a swashbuckling, time-traveling, debonair Edwardian hero is catapulted into the decadent, swinging 60s. Sounds like classic sci-fi to me. On BBC4 now, the cult of Adam Adamant. <laughs> In the 1960s, the BBC scored a short-lived hit with an action-adventure series about a square-jawed, swashbuckling time-traveller who dealt a weekly blow to the nation's baddies. Ah! A man in a block of ice! Popular at the time, but since overlooked, our cryogenically frozen hero has been revived by a new generation of cult TV fans. People would come up and say, what was the name of that programme with the defrosted Victorian adventurer? So oh, Adam Adamant lives. Uh, and they go, oh, yeah, I, you know, I, I thought no one else remembered that. I think it's as 60s as walking down Carnaby Street, you know, with Keith Richards or listening to the Small Faces or listening to, to Sergeant Pepper. It's, it's just a great pop art explosion. It was my job to look at the 60s with the baffled eye. I mean, we had the most enormous fun. No guns, Mr. Kingsley, if you please. It was seeing the Victorian age from a modern perspective. I work in a discotheque. A discotheque? Can't possibly imagine what that could be in this year. It was a show that sort of lingered in the memory of people who saw it. It's, uh, because it was uh, that late 60s, black and white, uh, rather strange, you know, twisted ideas and bizarre characters or whatever. It's the sort of show that you thought you might have dreamed. It's based on a very simple, basic idea, which all the best series are, and that's that uh, a detective uh, in 1900 and something uh, is frozen into a block of ice and thaws out in 1960s London. A hero figure if you like, who's good at everything. Um, highly educated, he can fence, he can box, <laughs> he can ride horses. He reveres women and puts them on a pedestal. Eventually, he uh, had a, a girl sort of sidekick, rather like sort of Batman and Robin. And, and she was the, the who represented the, the youth of the 1960s. With his acumen, um, and her up-to-dateness, they solve crimes. I know you're planning to blow up the Golden Mile, probably tonight. He was a great gentleman adventurer who, who lived according to a strict Victorian code of morals. Adam Adamant Lives was the BBC's answer to popular ITV shows like The Avengers, which had been on the go since 1962 and shared the same creative DNA, and makes Adam Adamant Lives very much a product of its time. At that time, London was, bec was becoming the most exciting city on earth. Uh, and we had the Beatles, we were producing the most exciting uh, pop music on earth. <clears throat> we'd, we'd taken the miniskirt, which made all the girls look terrific, uh, and it was all, it was like a bursting out. Yeah, that's it. Keep it happy. I mean, the 60s was this great breakout of morals and how people behaved and the fact that you, you felt if you were young, you could achieve anything. With your fingers. Yeah, yeah. We've got to change things, and, and part of that was in, in television, because television also was still a very young medium. And so we were all learning, and the people who were in charge uh, were exciting to be with and open to ideas, and a lot of things were done that I, you know, were experimental in a sense. Although, in general, productions from the BBC's drama department, like Armchair Theatre and the Wednesday Play, which gave us up the junction, were highly regarded, not everyone approved. Mary Whitehouse, the General Secretary of the National Viewers and Listeners Association, was proving to be a regular pain in the neck for drama boss Sidney Newman. He got fed up with Mary Whitehouse constantly attacking the Wednesday play and anything that drama department did as being entirely a sort of um, 
sexually sort of um, offensive and and so he thought I'm going to think of a hero figure that's going to be you know defending the right of, of women is going to be the sort of um, sort of saint-like figure so in fact he thought of apparently originally of, of someone like Sexton Blake as a boy Sidney Newman had been a big fan of Sexton Blake a sort of boy's own Sherlock Holmes it had less reasoning and more thumping all good clean fun but um, I, I think either they couldn't get the, the rights or they haven't got the rights or something. So they said, let's do something like Sexton Blake and call it Sixton Block or something. You know. So Sexton Blake was out of the picture, but there was still something in the idea of a Victorian action hero. He was looking out of his window one day and he heard the pneumatic drill go brrrr. <laughs> he thought, what if, a, what if a Victorian man came out of that as they dug up the road? Look! You have to remember at the times, the 60s, there was a, a, a big move towards fantasy adventure. I mean, you had the prisoner, you had the Avengers, and then you had Adam Adamant. And the BBC had got left behind, actually, because all these things I'm talking about, Jason King, the champions, they were all ITV shows. Because the BBC had never quite thrown off the shackles of it's got to be real and it's got to improve the mind and so on. Sidney Newman wanted the right person to take charge of his new project. Doctor Who's founding producer, Verity Lambert, immediately saw potential in the Clash of Cultures concept. Well, I think what appealed to me was really that sort of essential idea of how, trying to take a look, um, trying to step back and take a look at, at sort of how we were behaving in the 60s and how it would look to somebody who simply came from a completely different era with different moral standings. Verity would be the first of many women in Adam Adamant's new 1960s life, which is perhaps why Sidney felt that the show needed a feminine perspective. But Verity's presence at the BBC confused many of the male staff. She was very attractive, actually, which was a bit unnerving, really, because I wasn't used to dealing with... Uh, attractive producers. <laughs> well, let's face it, I wasn't used to dealing with women producers. She was um, in the vanguard of all that. And it had advantages in that a lot of men didn't really know how to deal with it, so they kind of were perhaps politer to me than they might have been to other people. I suppose that generation of women were the first, first women to probably work in the BBC. I mean, Moira Armstrong was certainly the first woman director that I worked with. But, I mean, there were only about four or five of us in both ITV and BBC. Apart from being a woman, I was considerably younger. I was only 26. And um, I, I think they couldn't quite understand what I was doing there, really. One of the first things she had to do was find a leading man with all the right credentials, someone highly educated who could box, could ride, could fence. I was the greatest swordsman in France. And Verity Lambert set, saw it me fencing about. And uh, they sent for me at the BBC. He was in a, um, a rather good classic um, three-part play. And I just loved his sort of, his elegance. I only fight with gentlemen. You can think yourself lucky. He is somebody who has a sort of rather old-world charm about him. And he's sort of slightly, he was slightly old-fashioned. And I said, uh, well, it's a lovely idea but I can't do it because I'm signed to do a play on Broadway. A lot of actors who came from the theatre had a, a very... Um, had an, not an attitude against television, but, you know, there was that hankering for the theatre as well, so you had to try and persuade people. You dare to frighten me. They said, listen, Gerald, this is going to make you famous. You're taking over from the man from UNCLE. You've got to do it. There's the phone. Ring up New York. And after some hesitation, he made that call. And right from the start, it was obvious he was right for the part. Adam! Adam, are you there? Gerald was very popular. I mean, he photographed terribly well. He was a very handsome man. <laughs> Sidney Newman, who was slightly mad, said he's got to have a widow's peak. We wanted to make him look just even more sort of apart from, the, you know, the period he was looking at. They spent millions of pounds on this amazing wig with this huge widow's peak. And then he said he's got to have eyebrows. And they stuck these damned eyebrows on me. 
The pilot was ordered, and for Gerald, his wig and eyebrows, TV starred and beckoned. But the leading man began to wonder if he had made the right decision. The first night's filming, we went up to Jack Straw's Castle, which is a pub in Hampstead. I sat there at about 11 o'clock, dressed up in a cloak, in this evening gear, with this wig and these eyebrows. I had four large whiskies and then I got on a white horse and galloped up the drive of a house. And I went home at three o'clock in the morning and looked at myself in the mirror. And I, I said, I have been acting in the theater to 500 people. I'm now gonna go out to 15 million people looking like this and I don't know what I'm doing. And I sort of burst into tears really. The pilot, which now forms part of episode one, details how his treacherous sweetheart, Louise, lures Adam into the clutches of the masked man, the face, who, being Adam's enemy, injects him with a serum that suspends his life indefinitely. He then really rubs it in by burying him alive. This unpleasant situation would have gone on forever if he hadn't been dug up by some workmen in present day 1960s. It's a man in a block of ice. Adam Adamant lives. Adam, 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 Adam. Yes, uh, all in good time. But first of all, paranoid and mumbling incoherences about the king, Adam is taken to hospital, but soon gets fed up with the NHS, prodding, poking, and sticking things into him. So makes a sharp exit straight into 1960s London. In order to achieve a sense of realism, or perhaps due to a lack of funding, the crew employed some guerrilla filmmaking techniques. I stood on one side, they put a camera over the other side of Piccadilly Circus, they said go, I threw off the Mac, took out the sword stick and walked out into the traffic, as if I'd never seen buses and taxis and cars before. The taxi driver started four-letter word cursing his head off and it brought the whole of Piccadilly to a, to a screeching halt. Because in those days, Piccadilly was ablaze with neon lights, you know, and to him, it was an invention of the devil. And when the whole of Piccadilly had snarled up, we packed up the cam, we ran before the fuzz came. Well, it was a long time ago, you could do that sort of thing. You know, you didn't ask the police, you just did it. I shall take my stand here. Let go of me, boy. I'm not a boy, I'm a girl. I'm not a boy, I'm a girl. And I suppose in a way, because we wanted Gerald to epitomise the Victorian era, we really wanted someone to play Georgina who, who said 60s, and Juliet Harmer, who we, we eventually cast. She was a very 60s girl, just in everything, that she, just in terms of the way she looked and everything. So. Um, we, we had to recast that part. For the pilot, Verity had cast Anne Holloway to play Adam's sidekick. But for the real thing, she chose the athletic Juliet Harmer to play Miss Georgina Jones. And they said, could I ride? And I said, yes. And could I swim? And could I do this and that? And yes, I could ski, all that. I thought, sounds good. We might be going to the Alps for a few episodes. No such luck as that. She's charming and very fanciful which is what I demand from a leading lady. Long, tumbling hair. She wore those wonderful caps. She's got legs about 90 foot long. And she had a naivete, which was absolutely enchanting. The characters first come into contact with each other when the boyish Georgina rescues Adam from his Piccadilly nightmare and takes him back to her 60s pad. He probably wouldn't have stopped or allowed me to help him when he first fell over when we first met if I'd been dressed as a woman. Who are you? Georgina. Georgina Jones. You can call me Georgie. Miss Jones, this masculine attire. Is it part of the madness outside? Some protective disguise, perhaps? Hey, watch it. This gear cost me a bundle. This gear cost me a bundle. That is some kind of code. It's bound to seem a bit strange. Strange? The fires of hell could be no stranger. You'll find it's all quite normal in the morning. I very much doubt that, Miss Jones. Please rest. Where am I? You're quite safe. You're in my room. You're a room? Then I must leave immediately. Why? Well, think. Your reputation, Miss Jones. Do you suddenly find you've been alone in an apartment with a woman without a chaperone? 
And, I mean, he nearly ran out of the place. It was the most appalling thing that had happened to him for some considerable time. Oh, don't be silly. I haven't got a reputation. Anyway, I'll be working most of the night. I hesitate to think what you might be doing. Ah. Would you kindly call me a handsome cab? He never understood your Jesus Jones at all. She was like a, a gnat or a wasp that throughout the series he kept batting away. I mean, almost everything was, hey, Mr. Adamant, wait for me, was the sort of end of every scene as he tried to get away from her and she came rushing afterwards. Hey, Adam, wait for me, you terrific, you terrific. I think she was fascinated and also I think she's probably quite attracted to Adam Adamant in her own way. He was fond of her, like an uncle is fond of a, a niece, I would say. What she felt, you'd have to ask Juliet Harmer. I think there was a sort of very subtle sexual subtext, which was never in your face. They didn't write the sex in, no. I don't know why. Whether that came out of Verity's thinking or what, I'm not sure. There was a plaque on the wall. Adam Adamant, gentleman adventurer, lived here. <laughs> Why? Other reasons sex isn't on the cards could be that all his friends are dead, that he has just learnt from Miss Jones that his home has been knocked down and the poor man has grown 60 years older. You are dead. You're 99 years old, Mr Adam. But Adam quickly comes to terms with his predicament and is swiftly back to his old career as gentleman adventurer. What exactly were your duties? Oh, ballet, cook, butler, tailor of my day, sir. He employs an ex-Punch and Judy man as his manservant. Jack May completes the show's central trio as Sims. Thank you, Sims. Jack, well, very, very clever, funny man. <laughs> he was very odd. I liked Jack a lot. He teased me and we got on very well. <laughs> A greedy young girl from Cologne simply couldn't leave starches alone, and the sweets that she ate made her so overweight, her shadow weighed 22 stone. <laughs> a lot of the, of the suaveness of, of, of Jack was him. That was, that was his character. Interested in horse racing, more interested very often than, than, than what the scene was about. We would rehearse in 25-minute bursts, because after every 25 minutes, he'd say, excuse me, and he'd go over to the phone in the corner of the stage room, and you'd hear him talking to his man of business. Oh, it went down, did it? All right. Now, what about that? It's six to four, is it? What? All right, yes, I haven't been on the six to four on, and I think I might back the other one each way. All right, talk to you later. And we'd have another quick rehearsal. Hello? Adam Adamant's residence, good evening. Ah, came up, did it? OK, would you double it up, then, on the next one? What have we got here? Let <laughs> me look at the racing post. Whoops! <laughs> you shouldn't interfere with the running of the house. I felt sorry for you washing shirts in a sink. Hasn't he heard a drip dry? You don't expect him to wear those. These are all handmade... So every week, as Sims stays at home tending to his master's shirts, Adam heads off to investigate this week's up-to-date crime. This symbol of Edwardian chivalry drove that symbol of 60s style, the Mini Cooper S. Georgina was just as fashionable on her Vespa. Well, I suppose we tried to look at what epitomised the 60s, and the Mini certainly epitomised the 60s. Every, I had one. We all had one. Well, the people all have them now. I mean, there's so many Minis. But it was the 60s symbol, and the scooter, and the freedom. <laughs> Jones, I wish to talk, not dislocate my vertebra. In fact, he learned to do a lot of things that, in fact, he wouldn't have done in 1902, um, because he, he found himself taking up the same position in the 1960s as he had in 1902, as being a sort of self-appointed hero figure, um, ready to, to fight women's battles and ready to defeat any evil in the world. Thank you. Your fluff, you'll be right over to take your order, sir. And every episode would provide another aspect of modern culture for Adam's Victorian and Edwardian values to clash with. I would hardly describe the moral disintegration of these young ladies as cute, madam. Because he had this attitude that women were on a pedestal and women were certainly... that he never could quite believe that women were evil and were... or could be evil or could be... or could do wrong. Do you always do what you ought to do? There was only one woman in his life 
And that was in 1864 or whatever. You're the only one to whom I have ever given my heart. But alas, dear Louise, I'm afraid I just cannot ask you to be mine. You see, my love for you could be used as a weapon to destroy me by the enemies of England. And she had brought him low. She was an accomplice of the face, that man in the river, who put him in the block of ice, which is where it all began. And for a man of Adam Adamant's ilk, there was only going ever to be one woman, even though she had treated him appallingly. With his unquestioning trust in womankind, having seen him buried alive for 60-odd years, surely Adam should have clocked that women were capable of dastardly deeds. But no. What else? The other thing you could rely on in Adam Adamant Lives was a good old scrap. I went down to Pinewood one day to do one of these great fights, and the great... Derek Ware said to me, all right, Gerald, he said, I'll swing you a rope. You grab the rope, you swing across the gym, you grab the wall bars, you spin round, you jump off them onto a springboard, up onto that horse, I'll swing you another rope, and you swing out of the other window. I said, yes, all right. All right. I said, do you think you could show me it once and then I'll do it? He said, don't be silly, Gerald, he said. That's bloody dangerous. Considering it was a family show, some of the fight scenes were quite violent and you did get a sense that Adam was a bit of a loose cannon, leaving a trail of dead bodies for the authorities to clean up after him. But teenage boys loved it. Well, there was a, a sort of a backlash against violence around about that time. Well, there's always a little thing going on, like the, the Mary Whitehouse syndrome, isn't there? Somebody gets on a hobby horse and says, oh, you'd be for the watershed and all that sort of thing. We certainly weren't criticised for sex or bad language in Adam Adam because we didn't have any. But, <laughs> but I suppose violence was the thing they found to criticise, the Mary Whitehouse brigade. No. I think we toned down the violence in the sense that nobody, you didn't see blood and you didn't see people getting killed. Or if you did, it was a sort of, with a sense of humour. As well as complicated fight scenes to learn, Juliet and Gerald had lines to remember too. A whole script every seven days. 13 one-hour shows in 13 weeks was quite a tall order by anyone's standards. I used to turn up on a Monday night. We'd be in the studio Sunday, and then we'd be in the studio Monday, and we'd turn up on Monday night with an hour and a half to do it. And you'd have all the sets in, a, in little boxes round this one studio. You know, there'd be six sets here. And I had a nice young man whose only job was to grab me and say, now you're in that set, because I didn't know where to go. Here we go. Absolute quiet. Well, a week to do an entire hour's episode in. We had big parts. We were both having to learn, oh, God, I don't know, 20, 30 pages of dialogue a week. It was impossible to remember all the lines. It was a sheer act of will. I just opened my mouth and something, something came out. But how can they talk about it if they don't know what it is? I think that was a lot to expect. I think perhaps it would have been better if we'd had a bit more time. 15 seconds. Eight, Eight, seven, seven, and it wasn't just the actors and the production crew who were four, under pressure. Three. The scripts were dashed off, some of them. I think the script, I think the idea was absolutely brilliant, and I think if the, the script writers had perhaps a bit longer... I never really felt we quite got the right mix of humour and adventure. I think, in fact, we went far too much down the line of... Mm, Daring do and detectives and murders and things. It could have been a whole lot more subtle. The speed of the thing was extraordinary, so that it was flawed. Right, everybody, hold it. Thank you very much, Sue. Back at seven thirty. Yes, well, there were a lot of unanswered questions. Where did Adam Adamant get his money? Where did he learn to drive that mini? How did he know his way around London? Because it ain't the same as it was in, in 1894 or whatever it was. Well, there just wasn't time to sort them out. Despite its minor flaws, the show was still hugely popular. But there was stiff competition for Adam Adamant and Miss Georgina Jones in the shape of John Steed and Miss Emma Peel. The figures were amazing. They were sort of 12 million or something. That's... By any standards, that's a lot of viewers. But I think they went down in the second series. 
And then I think we were put up against the Avengers. So whether that was deliberate or not, I don't know. All this time, the Avengers had been a lurking threat to Adam Adamant Lives. Edwardian gent and beautiful girl versus Edwardian gent and beautiful girl. Maybe the similarity was because they shared writers, although the Avengers had two weeks instead of one week to make their show. There was a certain amount of similarity because Tony Williamson, in fact, who at one time was the story editor on Adam Adamant, was very closely connected to the Avengers. So he'd written some of the scripts as well. In a head-on ratings battle with the slicker, sexier, better-funded Avengers, the Avengers won. The BBC dropped Adam Adamant Lives after just two series. The BBC decided just not to support it. Maybe somebody in the BBC thought, well, it's a bit nonsensical. They've never been strong on escapist fear, pure escapism. Uh, and that was really, as indeed the Avengers was and so on. I don't think there was a big thank you party and, oh, it's all... You know, I think it just sort of fizzled out a bit, actually. Please let it go. I think Adam Adamant lives, has, still has great appeal now simply because it, it's such a, a great swinging 60s piece of entertainment. My word, you have been patient. There is a, 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 a stripe of TV um, that is particularly suitable to cult, and I think Adam Adamant really fits into, into this, which is the sort of bizarre adventure show. Until very recently, Adam Adamant Lives had such high cult credentials that you couldn't actually see it anywhere. But now the surviving episodes have been given a spring clean and released on DVD, to the delight of cult TV fans everywhere. To mark the occasion, the original cast and crew were guests of honour at a special screening. We went to the British uh, Film Institute the other day and saw it absolutely massive on this huge screen with the new remastered copy. And one person said, this is a question for Juliet. Um, I said, yes. Um, Did you get any fan mail? I said, yes, I got masses. It was mostly from 14 or 15 year old boys. And my husband, he said, yes, and we're all here tonight. <laughs> to my amazement, the place was full, but it does stand up. It has a sort of gaiety. It has its, its halfway between a comedy and a drama, and, and it has an enormous sort of charm. I think it's a smashing concept, and I've never understand why it hasn't been remade, actually, because it would be even more startling now to come back from 1900 into 2006, because the differences are astonishing. So clever, but oh, so vulnerable, so you could argue that Adam Adamant is basically on indefinite hiatus. They haven't said he won't come back, you know. If anyone out there is, is willing to finance whatever happened to Adam Adamant, uh, I'd watch it. You know, I'd probably write it. I mean, if they remade it, they, it, it would have to be a bit more outrageous, I think. And they should remake it. I do feel an enormous debt to that gentleman and to Verity and to Sidney Newman. What on earth is this? Him? Your cake, sir. My cake? It was Miss Jones's idea, but happily I managed to persuade her not to bake it herself. How thoughtful of you, of both of you. It's very weird to see yourself aged 23. It, it is me and it isn't me, you know. It's a very, very odd feeling. Inside, you're exactly the same person. Here lie the eyebrows of Adam Adamant. 1966 to 1967, Labor in Progress. <gasps> Happy birthday. <laughs> You're the nicest hundred-year-old I know. All the best, sir. Look out for a celebration of one of the world's greatest film directors, Ingmar Bergman, with interviews and revealing documentaries, plus two of his best-known films. Starts tomorrow at 8.30 and continues Saturday at 10 on BBC4. Do you ever get the feeling like you were meant to do something extraordinary? Why does my heart go on beating? What's wrong with wanting to be normal? Why do these eyes of mine cry? Every one of them has come true. Don't they know it's the end of the world? It ended when you said goodbye.
Goodbye. Heroes starts Wednesday, July 25th on BBC Two. These are the trains moving six million commuters, run by men with old-fashioned computers. Carriages for women, carriages for men, rammed together in rush hour mayhem. Small children shoe shine for rupees and a bed. Women sell saris, green, gold and red. Ten people killed every new day. But the lives that are saved, too many to save. Bombay Railways, celebrating the lifeline of a nation, Wednesday and Thursday at 9 on BBC Four.